So welcome everyone. Thanks for, thanks for making time. Um, so I am Supriya Chaudhary. I work in international education. My, my work is uh, in India, UK, but also in China and Spain. So kind of roam around a bit, which I'm not doing currently and missing the travel quite a bit. Um, so this session here, we kind of want to focus on remote learning, particularly in the context of Indian education. Now, obviously there are these huge issues about access equity, but also about what are the alternatives we have and things like that. And we have a very diverse and distinguished set of panelists, which um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have various perspectives at least. Um, and, and frankly, um, I'll just make a quick couple of points. Uh, first is, we are not trying to predict the future um, in any manner, and we are not promoting one view or another. Uh, it's basically to have the conversation in a strategic manner by bringing various perspectives together, really. That, that's the objective of this session. Um, I know it's, it's, it's a debate right now. I've kind of read, um, interestingly, I, I don't know whether this is because I was to do the webinar or because it's, it's, it's going on. I, I was reading somewhere that only 8% of Indian households have proper access, um, a working internet connection and a laptop of some kind to do um, sort of online education. Now I did some work, I had one of my research before was in Kenya and it was about is just the laptop and internet connection work enough? Uh, and we found that a lot of people don't even have space where they can, they can just sit and do online education, um, that kind of thing. So we'd love to hear from all of you. So um, I'll just quickly introduce all the panelists um, and then mute myself. Uh, so, until they finish. So first, we would request Dr. Pankaj Gupta, who's the president of IIHMR University in Jaipur. Uh, Pankaj is an old friend. Um, he's a fellow of um, Institute of Chartered Accountants and a Fulbright fellow. And I have seen him at work at the helm of many Indian institutions over the years. And, and he obviously has great insights about regulatory uh, issues in India as well. Then we would request Dr. Devjani Chatterjee from I am Kashipur. Uh, now, Devjani is again, I know her many years um, and she's an alumnus of uh, IIT Kanpur. Uh, and of particular interest is uh, Devjani is the chairperson of student affairs at I am Kashipur and right now handling the COVID-19 strategy and transition. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure she will have many interesting things to say about how, how they are coping, coping with that. Uh, then uh, we would turn to Delia Hannigan, uh, Director of Education at Sanam S4. Um, Delia has spent many years in UK higher education, currently based in Delhi, um, if I'm correct. Yes. Uh, and uh, she has this unique transnational perspective, works very closely with many international universities operating in India and with Indian students. So we would love to hear from her and particularly about international education. That will be very valuable. Then we have uh, Lipi Chawla, who's, who's from Delhi University. She's, uh, she's just finished her uh, second year. Uh, she's a major in economics um, and uh, she's very actively in, engaged in issues about access and equity. So that will be, be very interesting to hear as well. Um, then we have Rohini. Lakhani, um, my bridge India colleague. Um, she, is, she just finished her graduation at King's College UK and uh, back in Hong Kong. And Rohini, Rohini has studied in uh, Hong Kong, UK and Spain, which is of my particular interest. Uh, and, and that'll be interesting to hear her transnational perspective um, about what's happening and what, what the future looks like. And finally, um, we have Professor Dr. DNS Kumar, who's the Vice Chancellor of Ansel University in Gurgaon. Uh, and Dr. Kumar is uh, in the forefront of new thinking. We, we are talking to him about many different uh, projects. Uh, and uh, I would request Dr. Kumar to summarize and reflect upon his experience um, about the whole transition that is happening. So, um, so that's, that's a quick 
introduction and I would request Pankaj to speak and present his, his views. Okay. Um, thank you, Supriyo. It is, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. So uh, it is indeed a great pleasure and honor to uh, be here and to sharing my views uh, with all of you. Uh, thank you to all the co-panelists and Namaskar and to all the people who are attending the webinar at this moment. See, the remote learning uh, is a concept which has been uh, in existence for long, but it is definitely an idea whose time has come now. And COVID-19 has really been a great, uh, uh, has given a great stimulus to the whole idea. And uh, now I think it is just going on and it is just to keep reforming the whole idea and see that what more can be done keeping in view the need of the learners, the need of the teachers and the other stakeholders. So uh, I'll be sharing the uh, experience from my university, that is IIHMR University, which is uh, set up uh, an institution has been in existence for the last 35 years. We are the premier university in the area of healthcare research, health management research. We have been a collaborative partner with the Johns Hopkins and it was nice to interact with Delia who mentioned that they are helping Johns Hopkins setting up in India. So what we have done that we have utilized this uh, challenge into a great opportunity. We have uh, converted many of our modules of learning into the online modules where our faculty members are working day and night to convert those all modules into the online modules. And some of them we have already uh, converting to the MOOCs as well. We have conducted many FDPs online because this period of two and a half months we utilized in you know, the capacity building of our faculty. And uh, there is a big surge in our research and publications. We have been holding uh, morning meetings over Zoom and team. And uh, so we feel even much more connect while we were coming every day to the office, uh, then we were not able to meet every day. Now we are having this meeting at 9.30 and uh, so we all are having a much greater connect. And in fact, we have a campus in Delhi and uh, Bangalore also. So we also have a weekly meeting where all the faculty from all the three campuses are together. So, uh, and also we have been holding different webinars for our current students, for our prospective and new students, alums. Uh, we have conducted many meetings like, you know, the Board of Studies, Academic Council and Finance uh, Board of Management meetings are just lined up next week. And we have also planned, you know, the e-convocation, which you are going to have on the 4th of July. So I believe that this challenge has given us a lot of new and innovative ways of thinking. And the things which we thought they were not available, they have certainly become available to us. So we, we noticed a higher level of productivity, saving of time. And though at times we feel the physical connect is missing, but uh, then, you know, there is no harm in, you know, calling somebody or talking one-to-one -one over Zoom or any other form of communication. So I see it this way that there are three kinds of models in remote learning. One is like a fully online model. Second is a hybrid model. And third is where you provide uh, small videos and capsules which are either recorded or you know blending with some live portion there. So all the three have a different kind of costing because if you're providing a faculty with a live lecture that will be more costly. But if you provide a totally online pre-recorded that is losing the excitement by the students. So that is also the reason why when you have these MOOCs courses, sometime you know you do not have that push. And uh, uh, how do you know how things are happening? Though with the help of technology now it is possible that you can track that my student has read how much of the talk, how much of the video they have seen, and accordingly, the faculty can always uh, do the change of the gear as required. So I have two more points. One is that there are certain courses uh, which uh, will be very, very hit in the remote learning. If you talk about data science, machine learning, accounting, finance, stats, all these things you can very well convert into nice modules. They can be taught really well. And uh, then if you talk about soft skills, teamwork, group dynamics, empathy, love, compassion, those things are difficult to teach in online mode. Though it is the perspective I'm sharing as of today, 
but tomorrow that may also change and um, the regulatory authorities have also looked into that to provide uh, required credit for this kind of effort and the reasonable freedom has to be given to the faculty members and the universities by which they can design this whole model uh, but i'd like to say that all these things uh, even the uh, soft still side also a lot of game simulations all these things can be created to make the learning more and more exciting and uh, the key here is how much are you listening to your students and uh, it is not that you know the lecture is going on and you are not listening so uh, keeping in view their feedback if you are continuously engaging and changing your offering then it can be a great thing and uh, there is uh, uh, also an opportunity uh, for the teacher to become a guru uh, because earlier you had only the india or maybe some geographical location for you but now the whole world is at your disposal i know that many of the faculty members are creating online courses online webinars online conferences and they are getting a great traction from all over the world so i'm also motivating all my faculty to create moocs courses and other online courses and uh, you know they can also make a lot of money as well so it is a great opportunity for india to be the global guru so i would like to share this and maybe later whatever you would like to ask questions i'd be happy to share thank you i hope i have not taken much time so please no that's fine i, I was muted uh, so devjani um if you start now hi everybody uh it's really nice and thanks to shupriya for inviting me for this talk i mean it's really very exciting uh, day before yesterday i was in another webinar related to this covid 19 issues and i was interacting with some of the people in the corporate the hr specifically so uh, we were discussing some of those things which i'll come to that later but uh, just to start with since i'm in the mba college i am kashipur so um, i'll start with something that we actually do and how we are actually going ahead of uh, handling those things both the physical the infrastructural as well as the online the possibilities and the advantages and the disadvantages of the problems and the issues that i mean it's kind of a swot analysis that we are doing now so uh, to start with the mba program start it's it's a six uh, stage process so first we start with the induction and the orientation of the students when they come to the campus and then it uh, then follows the class i mean i'm not uh, saying in detail the duration of this so the induction orientation lasts for around <clears throat> i'm sorry 10 days then comes the class then exams and quizzes in equal in i mean very frequent intervals then we have internships final placement and again the interview of the new students for the next year and their induction so it's it's a cycle it's a cycle like that so the problem that we are facing uh, this year is from the induction and the orientation process because the interview is already done and that was done uh, by uh, the month of march luckily though there is another program which, which we are starting this year that is mba in analytics so the mba analytics uh, interview was not over and we are going ahead with the interview of the students online so um, now that we start with the induction process or the orientation pro orientation process which is a face to face very interactive process which we do at iams <clears throat> this 10 days uh, the orientation is about orientation of the, the basic uh, skill courses which are done by the faculty and then the induction process which are the introduction to various clubs and committees and the uh, induction to these clubs and committees to selection and processes so that's a very interactive one so the first hurdle that we are facing here is since that's a very interactive one and also the orientation uh, making the students learn brushing them uh, brushing up uh, with the basics of uh, some of this accounting mathematics and all these uh, courses so but uh, this year since it's it's a challenge and it's a disruption and this disruption we are handling in the best possible way that is possible so um, the induction process this year will be an online one we are yet to figure out exactly what to include in the induction process but uh, yes uh, we have to be little interactive because without interaction and the induction process will be uh, taken by the obhr area organization of behavior hr area i'm also a part of that area so it's it's a it's a huge challenge for us that how to go ahead and interact with uh, more than uh, 300 students 
on the induction and orientation process. This is one of the hurdles that we are facing, but we'll figure it out because uh, just a few days back we had, and we are going ahead with some frequent meeting with the students, uh, the second year students, that's also more than uh, 250 in numbers. And it's, it's perfectly going smooth with uh, some of these uh, platforms like Google Meet and all, which we were uh, not so aware of earlier. I mean, we did know, but we never used it so hugely. So these are the disadvantages we already had. And we were thinking that will it be possible for us? We were in two minds. But now that we have no other way possible, I mean, no other way, so we are not in two minds. We know that we have to carry and I mean, go ahead with our business and we have to do it online. So the induction we are going at in the online process. Next is the class and which is the most important part of the uh, you know, PGP class or the MBA class that uh, we have. So the class is a problem this time again because of two things mainly. The first thing which comes is the social distancing. So once the students are coming to the campus, because it is not possible for all the, I mean, uh, all year through we go ahead only with the online courses because the students of IIM Kashipur and across all IIMs and across all uh, university and uh, good colleges, I would say that uh, they are competing not only with themselves, but they're also competing with those people who are sitting outside this institute. So when it comes to the uh, comes to placement, an IIM Kashipur student will be competing with another student of IIM of any other place. So if all the IIMs are not going ahead with the online class, then we cannot do that because we are also in the competition and we have to be at uh, in uh, I mean cope up with the situation. So what we have thought this year that seniors will be coming to the uh, I mean campus, uh, making it in groups. We'll do half online, half uh, offline, maybe breaking the class into several groups and repeating the class online and offline so that we can maintain this distance of uh, three to six feet, whatever are the government norms, I mean, the, the rules which is given to us. And uh, even before the class, there is one problem that we have. This is uh, when the uh, students come here, their isolation, their quarantining problem. So this one, we are maintaining the 14 days of quarantining and we will be interacting with them online. And we have uh, this uh, different modes which we are trying so that to engage these people when we are. Uh, the exams and quizzes this year, it happened uh, both online and offline. I mean, in the history of uh, this I am Kashipur, at least I know that this is the first time that we went with final exam in the online format. So we had a vendor and with, his, with their help, we did that. And I guess that in the future, we'll always, I mean, we can do that because more than 50% of the students opted for it. But the problem which we have faced, and uh, there are questions from the students because all are not uh, that, uh, you know, they do not have the access to the uh, internet connection, not all of us in India. So those, some of the st uh, studies in IMIA, it, it, it just said that uh, the rural population has more access to the internet than the urban population. But it's not only about the numbers, it's not only about the internet connection, it's not only about how they do the WhatsApp, that it's about how they connect to the classroom. And when it's the classroom bandwidth and everything which is necessary is more, which is required, which is, uh, it, it is huge. And it's just like that uh, updating a profile in an Insta. So we have this problem and we have students across India who are coming also from a very humble background and uh, staying in some of the very, very humble uh, places across India. And we really cannot expect these people to have a very proper connection to go ahead smoothly with the internet uh, classes. I mean, uh, networking online classes. We can be uh, at our ease, but they might not be. So this is the uh, disadvantage. Over to you, Shukriya. Maybe we can add something yeah. later. Thanks, thanks, Dejani. And uh, Delia? Yes, thank yeah. you, Supriya. And uh, thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. It was um, very interesting to listen to the challenges that you're grappling with. I think that what I've observed in the past uh, three months while we've been in this situation is how universities have moved mountains to be able to continue to operate um, with the challenges that we, we've all experienced. And it's certainly been fantastic to see colleagues um, achieving what they have achieved. 
but it's certainly um, a it's got deeper and longer term challenges for us as a an international higher education uh, sector. And uh, I've been asked to particularly look at how um, COVID and remote learning may well benefit in the longer term. And I think we have to look at that positive side, that we are in a challenge situation at the moment, um, but that we are going to come through that and we will probably have some silver linings from that challenge that will make a difference and possibly um, you know, uh, prepare our students better for what is basically their world. Um, I mean, we are preparing students who are going to be living and working for many decades in a world that changes very rapidly and is virtual. So I think that this opens up a great opportunity for Indian higher education that was already embracing these changes. It doesn't come without a cost and it doesn't come without the need for massive investment and creative thinking because we cannot be just about an elite who have access to, um, to the facilities. It has to be about equity. It has to be about ensuring that all the talents that we have across India are able to, uh, to be able to develop and to be able to build their careers and their families' lifestyles. So for me, that's very, very important. I spent my many, many years in, in the UK in what's called a widening participation university, where you are really spending a lot of time with students who are first generation into higher education and, and how you need to support them through that is something that I'm very interested in. Um, I think the opportunities uh, for Indian higher education to collaborate with universities from around the world um, are huge. And I know that many of uh, the universities I work with in India see this as a, a time when they will be able to work with colleagues in India in very many different ways. I think we need support from the government, both in terms of deregulation to allow those types of collaboration to develop. We need investment in inf infrastructure for Indian universities to be able to meet those needs. Um, but we can also share and learn best practice from each other. And, uh, and that I think is, is an exciting situation to be in. And I think the um, impact can be across the student experience. And you know, I am aware of universities both in India and outside where you've had virtual internships now put online, you've got virtual inductions as Dr. Chatterjee has been talking about. Um, you've got a whole range. My own university in the UK, for example, took a strategic decision five years ago when they were building a new campus to move completely to a blend, an active blended learning mode of delivery. So they built a university without any lecture theatres um, because what they wanted was the things that can be done online and can be done in a certain way um, would free up more time for that really um, focused and um, small group work that you can, you can work at. So that's a very interesting example. It's a very timely one. I think uh, we were all very dubious about it, but the vice chancellor had a vision and, and it has been delivered. And we're doing a webinar on that actually in a few weeks. So if anyone's interested in learning about that, then uh, please do look out for, for the webinar. On, it'll be on Sanam S4's website to talk to my colleagues uh, about that experience. But so we can do this and we can collaborate more. It does require um, you know, change from the government in certain ways. It does require that investment, um, but it will also be um, you know, beneficial. I think students can have eventually a richer experience, a different experience. We have to think creatively. Um, so for example, these things already happen, but they can now be expanded, where you've got joint projects going on, where you've got student groups who are sitting in India working with students in New Zealand. Um, and working on joint uh, and joint projects and getting that globalization, that internationalization without necessarily getting on a plane. So I think that that's something that we can think about. You can think about sharing, um, you know, uh, collaboration in, uh, in curriculum where you've got courses that are truly joint and developed and delivered remotely and using the technology that we're all going to be, um, you know, involved with. But I think it will also require um, support for staff because this is a huge change. When I first started teaching in university, we were still working on the basis of uh, PowerPoint was the cutting, um, uh, you know, um, overhead projectors was the cutting edge. 
Uh, now we are in a very different position. Obviously, that was many decades ago. But staff need to be supported. You can't expect somebody to simply move to this new way of teaching without investment in their personal development, how you change your pedagogy, how you work with a learning technologist to get your curriculum online and to make it the richest experience possible for the students that will be um, you know, experiencing that. Um, and there is a lot of work that's gone on around the world in these areas already where India will be able to access that and develop and probably speed up the development because they will be bringing with it another different um, set of eyes on this, a different lens. So I think it's an exciting time for India. It will open up lots of opportunities for different types of collaboration. I think we all need to think creatively about what that collaboration will look like, but it will not be um, easy and it will not happen without investment and support from the government because universities do need to have that access to resources to allow this to be developed and particularly to ensure that it is not just for people who have the, the money to be able to afford either to buy um, laptops or to make sure they've got the best connectivity um, or even to have the best physical space because I think the, the point that you made Sophia is a point that I make to my colleagues in universities overseas who are thinking about moving online for their international delivery not everybody has access to the perfect office space to sit and work in. So it's a whole range of levels. And I'm just going to finish now and hand over to the students because it's very important to, to hear that angle. Um, it's also about right the way through schools. You know, at the moment we're experiencing groups of students who've been dropped into a different type of teaching and learning than they'd ever expected to experience. Hopefully, as we move out of this and into the medium and long term, we will be seeing those opportunities are developed in schools so that when students get to higher education, it's not such a, uh, a shock and, and something they have to learn to cope with. It's a natural transition. It's how they learn and it will then be how they work and live um, and, uh, and develop their careers in the future. So I think that's my five minutes. So I'm now going to, to hand over. Thank you. Um, to Thank my you, next uh, panelist. Thank you very much. And we have some questions coming in, so I'll, I'll kind of take them once all panelists are finished. So I'll ask uh, Lippi first and then Rohini um, to make a contribution about your views and your lived experiences as well, please. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I think in terms of my own experience, it's been one of the easiest that has been there from all the students that are in my university. I study at Delhi University and it's a public university. We have around 80 colleges. We have 1.5 lakh students and the majority of them don't have the resources right now to make this transition. So while for us, like the major stress was we had to wait a full two months to see if our exams would happen or not. We got absolutely no like notification from university about that. There were many online protests that happened as well because this happened in the middle of our mid, like, uh, mid semester break. So we all had only gone back for around a week at the most. None of us carried our books with us. We had no material with us and we were suddenly expected to give online exams. So even from the like ways that we found out, um, around 90% of the people don't have the books, the resources at all. At least 75% of them don't have proper internet connection to even avail in these online classes. So finally last week we got to know that first and second years will be graded on the basis of internal assessments as half our grade and the past semester grade for the other half. The problem with that also then becomes that the internal assessments that we had, they happened online. So for a majority of the students, they automatically get a zero in that because they couldn't go ahead and do it. In terms of BU, like a large, like a large number of people are from Kashmir and they're still on 2G. And even third years who are now giving their exams, if you look at like the frequently asked questions that exist for them, People have asked if they can give exams with 2G and the Delhi University site themselves said you will need 4G to go ahead and actually access these exams. So there'll be a large number of people who potentially can't graduate this year at all because they won't be able to take these exams. A large number of people in the first and second years who couldn't give internal assessments. Even from the practicals that have already started happening, 
there have been a lot of accounts of people who then have gone ahead and said like they did everything they wrote the paper they scanned it they tried uploading it but because these files are heavy and these are three hour exams it's a huge file even if you compress it to whatever possible so even then like there have been accounts of people who constantly go ahead and try to upload it and it fails to upload their racket for hours and then they can't submit it so in terms of just people even attempting exams or being able to submit these exams has been a huge problem for like a large majority of the people even in terms of the guidelines that the university has given i don't think anyone really finds them adequate at this point we normally when exams happen in college for like people with like physical disabilities etc you get scribes to write exams so you get a separate room you can dictate your exam and they'll write it as of now for third years who are giving exams that's something that's not at all possible so they also cannot give the exam anymore in terms of that like even if normalization happens in the long term unless there is a way that we can go ahead and provide access in terms of the internet and like a laptop or a proper like smartphone etc these things aren't something that a majority will ever be able to adopt to so the only alternative that we can find for right now is for this semester at least that we don't have exams because normalization in the long run might be possible especially it's a lot easier for some people but for others as well if there is ever a way that we can provide internet and laptops etc it might happen but for right now we haven't gotten absolutely any response so all of our teachers all our students everyone's gone ahead to like like they've written letters to the president to the like home ministry education ministry to like not have exams for this semester at least because people can't get their degrees if you do that but we haven't got an absolutely any response so all that like for us at least that we've seen covid bring about a change is that it really widens the gap in that sense there are a few people who will be perfectly fine with it the only change that's come about is minor inconveniences in the sense like you have classes at odd hours you have like a huge amount of workload because it's not well planned and all our assignments are cramped in the one week that we finally realize we will have to take them but for the majority like availing these like educational institutions at all then becomes impossible so in that scenario i think like at this point all we can do is like hope to get a response because all our teachers are against it as well no one has the material the couple of classes that we've had as well because there are so many people suddenly like getting on like a zoom call or so many people using internet we've had classes at the most absurd of times i have a junior who had a class at 6:30 am because that's when the least number of people use it all of my microeconomics classes happened at 8:30 because that's when she thinks like the least number of people will be online so there's no timetable that's left for us anymore there's no like strict 8:30 to 4 pm college that we used to have so it's all happening at absolutely any time that we can find to make it like okay for as many people as possible but when you are a public university and a majority of your students come from a very diverse background a majority of them can't access it it becomes extremely unfair to like allow the 20% to go ahead and graduate because they can access things like online like online journals or like online exams and like to do nothing for the others so yeah i mean just in terms of that even higher education at a later level hopefully from what we can see online degrees will become more acceptable so we will be able to go ahead with like other institutions institutions abroad that we couldn't economically access before but that's the only problem because the divide is widening so much for some people it's going to result in extremely great things that they can now access foreign universities etc also but for others like education at all becomes a problem so that's just something that we really need to prioritize right now according to me dipi thank you and uh, rohini hi uh firstly thank you for inviting me to this panel i've been looking forward to it for a long time because it finally opens up a conversation on this topic and allows students like lipi and i to represent students who i do feel have been overlooked for a long time during this entire crisis So I do acknowledge that my perspective is not um one that comes from studying at an Indian university I studied in the UK and I bring the perspective of an international student but I do feel that those perspectives are still relevant because you have migration all throughout India and the world so these experiences still hold true and um just a bit of background on my experience with education in general I do um 
appreciate how technology has been increasingly interwoven into uh, education. So you had, you know, we have this thing called lecture capture at university where lectures are recorded and then students can see them wherever they want. We have virtual, uh, we have PowerPoints uploaded, we have journals online. So there has been this transition to, um, you know, incorporate technology more and more. But again, as an international student, I, pr I place a greater premium on physical presence. That is the whole reason why I went from Hong Kong to the UK. And, you know, there are various reasons that influence this decision. So beyond the world-class teaching that is offered at a university like King's, I um, also chose to move to London because of the proximity to Europe. So that's my degree. I did European studies with the Spanish pathway. So that geographical proximity was important to me. Studying in London, being surrounded by world-class employers was also important to me. And yeah, it was just the entire university experience. So there are many reasons why you go and you leave your town to study abroad. And this does set your experience apart from other people who perhaps stayed locally in their area. So the physical presence was key. You can spend hours if you want or minutes discussing a topic of interest with your professor. You can go to the library, you can join societies, you can um, you know, spend hours at the student union. Those are aspects of the university experience which make it unique regardless of whether you went abroad to study or you stayed locally. And as we all know, none of that is really possible nowadays. And we are confined to the laptop and having these interactions virtually, which does make it difficult. And again, as someone who has to pay more than a local student to study abroad, I simply cannot justify continuing to do that. So that is the reason why I decided to defer my master's application. So I will not be going back to the UK to study um, global affairs in September because it's just not worth it. And the reason I say this is because Kings has, Kings like many universities have said that they will have, they will implement the hybrid model that um, I believe Dr. Pankaj Gupta mentioned at the start that you have in-person and virtual classes. But given the last few months of my undergraduate degree, I did experience virtual learning and I do acknowledge that I am in that privileged position where I have a working Wi-Fi and I can access, you know, video calls and classes through that. It's just not the same because I, my course, like I mentioned earlier, is more conducive to online learning. I don't have to physically be in the classroom, but there is, we do place a great emphasis on being able to have dynamic debates and discussions and when you're on a video conference there, you might have great Wi-Fi, but your partners might not. And their Wi-Fi might inhibit their ability to debate. And that shouldn't happen when you are at university. Everyone should be treated equally. And your internet connectivity, like Lippy mentioned, should not really hinder your performance. And um, so what King's, so that is what King's has been doing to you know, facilitate this transition to online learning. They've implemented Microsoft Teams to allow us to, you know, at least continue on with some classes, but quite personally, it is not the same. And then the time zone difference does play a role as well. So you have classes at random hours. I've had to have a call with my teacher at 11.30 p.m. because that's what worked seemingly well for both of us. But it does, you know, if <coughs> you might adjust to these changes, but it doesn't keep the same uh, experience. It, it really does strip a student of that entire experience of going to university, whether, they, whether that includes socializing with people from around the world or sightseeing in a new city or like just growing up as an adult. I know this might seem like a superficial or soft uh, skill, but I do think that you can't overlook that. And that is why I'm against normalizing remote learning because it, it really does strip you off a rite of passage, so to speak. And I know that is quite a privileged opinion or critique to have, but that is something I wanted to add to this discussion to make sure that that was taken into account. And beyond that, there are also practical implications of remote learning. You have to 
sit at your desk for hours on end staring at a screen, which is not healthy. There is a reason why universities make an effort to have, um, you know, attractive physical spaces so that students go outside, they see the sun. But, you know, I have a younger brother who's been studying online for months now and just seeing him at a desk, that is not something I want the future to be like. And um, I know that this is something that will hit universities very harshly. And I read an article that uh, projected universities to lose, uh, UK universities to use approximately 460 million pounds with deferrals for September, which is a huge amount. And this impact is said to last about four years. So that clearly shows that, you know, you can have these technological advancements, but at the end of the day, the students hold a lot of agency in deciding how influential or how successful these methods would be. And um, I think I won't take up too much time. I think I've made my point, but that's, that's, mainly what I wanted to add to this discussion. Thank, thank you, Roini. Uh, Dr. Kumar, if you kind of could kind of summarize and respond, but also I, I've noticed that there is at least one comment which has come in from Dr. Sharma from Jammu and Kashmir, which says that, you know, her students are not that, um, you know, they are, they're able to do it, two to 5% yeah, student only uh, having I trouble have... and things like that. As well. Supriya, I, have noted, uh, I noted the contain, comment coming. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Supriyo, thank you so much for the opportunity. And good evening to my fellow panelists. Uh, let me build a bit of uh, background to the higher education in India. You know, over a period of time, we have seen whether it is India or other continents or other nations higher education is one of the important pillar of economic development. Having said that, it is also in the public good. It's for a public good, wherein socioeconomic and scientific developments, it takes care of. But at the same time, we need to understand one aspect of higher education. What is higher about that higher education? And that is a liberal education. The question that comes before us is whether the remote education which is coming to stay is going to address properly the liberal education and how and with what bandwidth. Having said this, a backdrop, we do have good bandwidth in India as far as number of institutions are concerned. 935 plus universities, 50,000 plus institutions, you know, the system of education, that to higher education, is well in place. The, the webinar title speaks about, has remote learning come to stay? With my experience as a student for the last 10 years, although I'm a professor for the last 30 years, but I did a lot of learning during the last 10 years also, and that all was a remote learning, online education. Obviously, you know, my answer to that question is going to be, yes, remote learning is going to stay in India. How do I say and how I justify and defend it? You see, this remote learning as compared to conventional education is going to give an opportunity to the students to learn at their pace and convenience. Today, what is happening, offline education, you have to go to the universities and when the students are there, the professor goes and classes happen, that's it. But in remote learning, when you have online materials, maybe video, audio, PowerPoint presentation, other support, the students or other corporate executives who wants to learn the higher learning, who wants to unlearn, they can learn at their convenience and at their pace. At the same time, remote learning, although it has been practiced to some extent in IITs, IIMs, and some of the best of the best standalone institutions, as far as training, development, and all is concerned, this is going to help in a big way as far as continuing education is concerned. India, as compared to you know, Western countries, training and development had not picked well because there was no bandwidth. The economics was not permitting. 
therefore we are not patching in but with this remote learning, uh, remote learning if we establish the bandwidth many people many good people will be able to take continuing education not only across the india as professor gupta mentioned it can be taken across the world also that is second part the third aspect which i would like to touch is looking into the economic conditions in india and cost of education today cost of education in private educational institutions is pretty high now this remote education is going to bring down the cost of education which is going to benefit not only to the students but also to the parents and to the community at large having said that let me come to the dream of prime minister narendra modi he has mentioned today we have 24% ger gross enrollment ratio in higher education and by 2030 he wants to take it to 50% to take that gr to 50% and looking at the demographic dividend that we have in india with such a high population the current 50000 institutions 935 universities will not be sufficient and there it is the it is the remote learning which is going to help us at the same time one of the panelists mentioned a student coming from delhi university the students and teachers are not that well trained well adopted in terms of technology and all now this is a time we have to unlearn what we have done in the past is not important and what is for the future is important so this gives us an opportunity to learn the new skills and competencies along with the technology which are required for new generation of economy at the same time you know in india education has become a standardized education if delhi university is doing bcom programs Christ University also does same thing. Ansel University also does something. Some other also does something. Now here is an opportunity. If the if the UGC and AICT, if the regulatory authorities are going to permit, you can customize the requirement which is required for that region or for that lo uh, the, that nation. So the products and the programs are going to get disrupted. I do agree with the uh, Delia. it is going to bring a lot of collaborations there there were some restrictions for international universities to come to india but this is a time the government is going to open the government is going to tell the educational institutions to go ahead and have the collaborations now also requires some norms to be relaxed currently the norm which is there to go for online education is and currently only five universities out of 935 universities who have been permitted to go for online education the restriction is they should have covered they should have scored 3.51 nac score nac score now the ugc is thinking and finance minister has already approved 100 plus universities will be allowed to go for online so this is going to you know some relaxation is going to come from the government also i do noted some of the issues which were raised by some of the one of the panelists about the net the internet wifi and all for your information government is already working for uh, to ensure bharat net across india the, the 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 name of the net is bharat net across india wherever you go you will get 4g or 5g even 6g also this issue also government is addressing then also it is going to you know the different forms and modes of collaborations are going to come you can go in the form of virtual universities see one of the concern having said yes to the remote education which is going to stay is one of the concern which i am going to see is some of the best of the best professors may leave best of the best universities institutions and they may start their own virtual institutions to offer very high end skill and competency oriented certifications at the same time the second concern that i have having said remote education is going to stay is liberal education may get a hit unless attended well because it is the liberal education which balances the economy society and the development which has to be well taken care at the same time you know uh the government needs to do away from some of the restrictions that are we have currently 
financial strength to start the new institutions. Suppose these are the private institutions. Government has put a condition in different state, different norms. You have to deposit endowment fund, 3 crore, 5 crore, 25 crores. So government has to come out of it. This change is very much required. At the same time, yearly compliances allow the institutions to do better performance instead of asking the universities or the institutions to comply. Then the remote learning is going to add a lot of values. At the same time, norms of land, land requirement, number of faculty, this kind of, you know, the restrictions which are there, government has to come out. To give an example, if you want to set up a private university in the state of Karnataka, you need to have 25 acres of land. So if it is going to be online or the virtual university, you don't require a, a lakh plus square feet of building is more than sufficient to run an education. At the same time, number of faculty, you don't require the number for the sake of number. If you have qualified, competent faculty members, you will be able to take it. So some of the benefits which are going to come as Professor Gupta in the introductory mark he made is productivity. I also have seen in my university, wherein we have gone 100% online education, 100% examination also we have covered. Some of the practicals also we have done online, wherein productivity of my professors has gone up. The time which is required to deliver in order to make the assessment, in order to take the new things also is less. At the same time, as he rightly mentioned, we'll be able to keep a track of learning by the students. There are platforms I use in my university, TCS ION as a platform. I'm able to track how much time professors have pitched in online class, how much time the students were there, how many questions they have answered, and how much time they took to answer the question, all this. So my answer to the question, to the topic is yes, remote learning is going to stay and it is for the good of the nation. Keeping in mind the development which the prime minister and the government is thinking, it is it is aligning aligning with that. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank, thank, you. My thank you, Dr. Kumar. We just have enough time. So I'll I'll summarize. I kind of noted the questions that came in. So from Grace Dixon in New York, um, Indrajit Roy, who kind of teaches both in Cardiff and and in Presidency University Calcutta, as well as Deepa Mistra. So I think the common theme across those um, questions and the feedback we receive from the audience that um, remote learning is actually a different thing. Uh, it needs to be, the materials need to be repurposed, the whole pedagogy needs to be thought through, uh, engagements need to be redesigned. Now, I think that's the summary from looking at these questions. So if you can quickly respond, I, I would ask all panelists to actually respond whether you think, uh, if you look at the questions as well. So what do you think is needed to, to create this transition at the institutional level? So, and, and what kind of skills and abilities, what kind of people, uh, what's the thought? Chupriyo, I have something to say here, if I may. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, like that, uh, what uh, Dr. Kumar uh, shared that it's, uh, it's here to stay. I do also agree to this, but uh, one point which I need to make here is since we are already struggling with so many things here, that it is not a substitute to of offline education. Of course. Online education was here, like this Coursera and all these kind of educations and certification programs we do have in India. And there are many open universities which offer degrees and diplomas. But the point here still stays that offline education, I sorry, online education cannot be a substitute to the offline and the face-to-face -face interaction, interactive education. It can only be a complement to what we can like the learn for the executives who would like to learn and they don't have the time for the regular university or the institution classes. It's very good for them. We also run some of these kind of courses, but uh, programs, but still I would say MBA offline, MBA online, it does make a huge difference because uh, we are uh, missing out on the cohort learning while on online, uh, uh, very less interaction, less interactive sessions, because we also learn as teachers in every class. We do interact a lot with the students. We do get to know many of the examples. Mm -hmm. Many of these people are coming with experience and we also learn. 
so this learning is transferred to the next uh, generation of the students which who comes so i think there needs uh, it needs uh, and uh, my class specifically which i would like to note here uh, i my class is very interactive in uh, because mm -hmm. i feel suffocated otherwise so uh, what i felt uh, online education in online education that kind of interaction is not possible this is one point nevertheless we have to look at the sustainability and also the business perspective so given this is the situation and this is a disruption and we are managing it we are forced to fit ourselves to the situation it is a reactive response we are not being proactive the proactiveness which maybe we are doing now not only us but mm -hmm. maybe uh, the world as a whole is looking forward to a more online kind of a business online business online education to uh, utilize this opportunity this is my uh, yeah, yeah, i mean thank I you that, that's that's helpful of course uh, delia please um I so if you can to, respond i, I just the... want to very very quickly to say that it's about reimagining what we're doing it's not about either or it's mm -hmm. about making sure that we reimagine that we're creative in how we now address what the future is and um, and so i think it's exciting it's not i don't think we should ever lose some of the things that lippy and rohini were talking about as important to them mm -hmm. but i think it's about reimagining how we blend things together and it's really important not to turn education into a transaction it's about an experience it's about opportunity it's about growth and you are just using different tools to to support that and uh, and i and i i think we've had a really interesting discussion and it's been fantastic to be part of it i've really enjoyed it and i know that uh, dr gupta wants to say something so i'll finish okay okay, okay. thank you thank you uh, i would like to say that uh, when uh, uh, supriya was asking that what needs to be done i will say that one single thing is uh, uh, the whole attitude around it that has to be changed and uh, once you know that it is uh, here to stay and it is uh, good that we should you know befriend it and use it in our advantage and secondly the very belief that uh, sometimes we feel that we have to teach the student but uh, even this belief is not true the students already know so many things and uh, it is just you know to facilitate that learning so uh, the old model that i have to teach and they will learn you know it has to be a co learning together like when we teach a course on case study method we see that okay you know we we put one student against uh, another one and you know we we see that how the learning is discovered together so it has to be more of a partnership approach and uh, for that the entire mindset has to change and openness and also the subject which are related with the inner journey and uh, inner being you know the gone are the days when you do and have before doing there is a being part and the being part is the most important thing and when the being is there that can be taught by a more of a face to face learning but all the other things you know the machine learning and ai based uh, systems can always help that would be my view thank you and uh, i would like to yeah, just please. add one thing here uh, although you know remote learning is going to come you know it is going to be teacher led it's not going to keep away the teachers it is the professors it is the teacher who are going to develop it there there will be sufficient sufficient scope for the teacher to come with the different approaches of teaching and a learning in the course of deliverables okay i i would like to take another question about research collaboration but quickly um, if roini and lipi can respond whether what you hear kind of reassures you a bit more <laughs> that that there is thinking um i think i definitely agree with some of the points that have been raised that it does increase accessibility and the scope for collaboration across the world and there is a lot of potential to be discovered there the only uh word of caution i would put in is that there needs to be a a shift away from adapting to uh remote learning and more so repurposing remote learning because what i've seen is that so far a lot of teachers and with no fault of their own because we're all learning and adapting here but a lot of times what you do in the classroom has just sort of been modified a bit and tried and like mm -hmm. done virtually which just doesn't work so if moving forward if remote learning is here to stay i do wish that there would be a greater emphasis on 
um, designing the classroom and learning experience to be tailored to the digital world. That's my only sure. critique moving yeah. forward. Yeah, and Lippi, I, I must say that you made a great point about exams being the driver of this divide and, and kind of that made me think completely. I, I think we need to think about the exams, but quick response before I, I go over the time. Yeah. You're uh, happy no, with what you're getting? Uh, I think it is the reality in today's time that there is no way that offline learning for a while at least can be done oh. with. So, given how we are going to shift to online regardless of whatever we may feel, it is about really what we've heard in this panel. We're going to have to adjust a lot. We're going to have to remodel how it works, even in terms of things like soft skills, in terms of how we learn a lot, in terms of like societies, clubs, social interactions at every point. These are things that we will no longer be able to have. And given how it's going to become a lot more in terms of academics, we will have to find that balance of making it interactive enough for students to make up for things that they would normally do that gets us like a more holistic education. So in terms of that, I think it's really just remodeling to the best that we can with the resources that we have right now. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and for the sake of time, we are over time actually, but there is a question which I want to take about research collaboration and how that changes. And for the sake of time, I'll point it to Delia. And if you, if you can just say what the university's yeah, very thoughts quickly. are. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, research collaboration is not going to be changed by this. It actually will be expanded. Okay. Um, if we are, you know, more active in the virtual realm, then you will have opportunities for research collaborations across borders in a much more, and I think COVID research is an example of that, that impetus of universities working together around the world to look for a vaccine and to look at how we could cope with the impact of the pandemic is an example. So research will only be supported and improved by um, universities embracing the virtual space. But it does require that reimagining and that rethinking of everything we do. It can't just be a lift and shift of what was the the face to face. It has to be, let's rethink, let's be creative, let's imagine different ways of doing things and using this tool to improve learning for everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks very much. We are over time. Um, I, I think we can go on, but we'll we'll show up in Sanam S4 presentation. Yes, do come. Do come <laughs> yeah. because it's going to be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we can continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the panelists and thanks to all the audiences as well. Great questions. Um, I, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Probably not on Zoom. But yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 B